Funding for the Muppet History Podcast is made possible by the amazing people who support our Patreon. Thank you to everyone who keeps us going. And now back to the show. It's the Muppet History Podcast with your host, Joshua Gillespie, and featuring Madison Mantis. Yay! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third episode of the Muppet History Podcast. I am your host, Joshua Gillespie, the creator of Muppet History, and I am joined, as always, by my good friend, Madison Mantis. Hi, guys. Welcome back. We have something really fun planned today. So fun. I'm so excited. We have a special guest, the Hanson historian, biographer, really nice guy, Brian J. Jones. <laughs> that is a heck of an introduction, Joshua. Thank you. Waka waka. Wow. Welcome. Ooh. Welcome, Brian. Our, our first uh, guest star. And this is a really special one for me because I credit Brian J. Jones and his Jim Henson biography as kind of what sparked me starting Muppet History. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, reading it, I was like, there is so much in just fascinating stuff and so many fun stories oh, yeah. to tell. I, I want to do something with Good. this. I'm just, so. I just need to say, I've probably listened to the uh, audiobook like maybe 17 times. Yeah. Like it's, I, I don't think I've listened to anything else. <laughs> That's it. So I would, I just want to <laughs> say thank you, Brian, for being such a big inspiration to me. And, um, yeah, um, I guess first question I want to ask is how, what was your history with the Muppets? How were you introduced to them? Well, I am um, Sesame Street Generation 1 because I was the initial Ooh. audience for it um, in 1969. I was two when the first installment came out. Um, and and oh, so wow. I was raised on Sesame Street. And then I uh, remember seeing the Muppet Show on TV in its first run. Uh, I actually saw Dark Crystal in the theater. <laughs> I saw Labyrinth in the theater. As Lisa Henson said to me, oh, you were the one. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, oh, oh, so, so, I go, so I actually go way, way back with them. Now, it's interesting because we all sort of think that the Muppets are our own. And I remember my mom at one point was watching the original, was watching the Muppet show and said, oh, Rolf the dog, Rolf the dog. I used to watch him on the Jimmy Dean show. And I was like, no, mom, there were no Muppets back oh, when you wow. were a kid. There were no Muppets. Like, you know, I thought she was making it up. And of course, and then of course found out <laughs> later that, that she was not. And uh, th- what I love about that is she used to tell me that when she would watch it with her mom, the Jimmy Dean show, uh, my grandmother could not figure out how Rolf worked uh, and was, and was convinced it had to be, and <laughs> was, convinced it, well, was convinced it had to be a person in a costume. Oh, okay. My gosh, that's hilarious. Imagine that, though. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Yes, and then I and I used wow. to check out um, of Muppets and Men out of the library constantly. Um, it was a book that I, mm-hmm. I I checked out and read that till almost the cover fell off. It finally ended up buying a copy of it <laughs> off of eBay. Yeah, I was going to say, and I actually, <laughs> did and, they just and, give it to yeah, you? Yeah, and like you, Josh, I actually got one that had like the paper cover intact. It's a beautiful copy. I've never seen such a nice copy of it. And so, what inspired you to do this uh, biography? on Jim? You know, I wish I had a great answer for that um, because (laughs) I, I I, well, I remember when it came up, I was on Jim's um, Wikipedia page and I don't remember why, um, but I was on Jim Henson's page and I was reading along and there was something in there uh, that I went, you know, gee, you know, I wonder where they, I wonder where they got that. And I went down to the bottom of the piece, um, you know, like, like Wikipedia references anything. They like, yeah, they yeah, but, but Muppet fans are but Muppet fans are actually pretty good about it. Um, most most pages are not. Muppet fans are good about it. And when I went down to the bottom of the page and looked, it was you know Jim Henson the works and Jim Henson designs and doodles and of Muppets and Men, and it was yeah. all stuff about the work. And there wasn't really anything about Jim himself. Uh, and so this was nineteen not nineteen. This was two thousand six or so, or two thousand no about two thousand eight. And so you know at that point Jim had been dead eighteen years. And so I thought Jim's dead. And I so and so I thought, well, he died. You know, somebody's. I can't believe nobody's doing this. Um, you know, maybe, maybe there's a Robert Caro who's been writing about Jim Henson for 20 years, and we just don't know about it. Yeah. Um, so I so I called my agent and and said, you know, I'm, I'm I'm thinking about doing Jim Henson, but I can't believe somebody's not doing it. Um, 
you know, have you heard anything? Because agents have access to, you know, information us mere mortals don't. Um, and, and, you know, did a look and he said, no, I don't see that anything's ever sold on this. I don't see anything pitched. I don't see anything moving. And I said, well, I'm going to see what I can find out. And so I, uh, I went over, I lived in uh, Montgomery County, Maryland at that time. And Jim had gone to school, as we all know, over at University of Maryland, which was the next, yeah. was the next county over for me. So I went over, I went over. That's to visit, a crazy coincidence. Yeah. So I went over to, yeah. I went over to visit the head archivist at the Henson collection. There's a video collection over there. Um, which at that time was the only place you could see the unexpurgated version of Emmett Otter, by the way. Wow. Um, and so I, so I went over to talk with him and, you know, on, on the, on the face of it, I was like, you know, let's talk about Jim Henson and why Jim Henson is really important and why we still, and really all I wanted to ask is, are you writing a biography of Jim Henson? Um, yeah. and, you know, just trying to find out. And so, you know, we had this pretty good conversation about 25 minutes or so. And, and, and then I said, you know, given everything we've talked about today, his name's Vin Novar. I said, everything we've talked about, Vin, um, why is there no biography of Jim and just waiting for that shoe to drop? And he said, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really know. Um, that's a great question. And so from that, Vin put me in touch with, um, Arthur Novell, who at that time was, um, he might've even been the president at that time of the Henson legacy up in New York, which as you guys know, okay. was, was set up to, you know, by, by Jane and a lot of the business associates to advance like the art of puppetry. And it's not solely the Muppets, you know, it's, it's, it's all about Jim and, and his art. Um, yeah. And so, and so I started a conversation with them about, you know, there's no, there's no biography of Jim. And at that point, Jerry Joel had recently died. I think even Bernie Brillstein had just died. Um, they were starting to, we were starting to lose people. And so yeah. I was just trying to make the case to them, you know, you, you guys have a ticking clock here, it seems to me. Um, let's get some of these people on the record. And I didn't realize at that time that Jane was actually ill. Um, so, so Jane yeah. got it, I think as well. Jane was actually, Jane was actually a pretty early and strong advocate for it, even as she was the toughest nut to crack. Um, wow. So I spent about the next two years just meeting constantly with the family and having conversations, you know, with them in diners. And you know, I went out to, to the Jim Henson Company out in California with my agent. And it's funny because a literary agent and a film agent are apparently two different things. <laughs> and like, and even, in, even in California, they can't stand film agents. And I was like, this is not a film agent. He's a literary agent. <laughs> like, he, does, he doesn't get paid until I do. Um, and, uh, and just had really – but had really – good conversations with the Hensons, just getting to know them. And, you know, they wanted to make sure that I wasn't up to no good because, you know, we all, we all know the mythology of the Ron Powers book that had come back yeah. at one point and bit them in the ass. And, um, and so, you know, so they were really, you know, it was, it was, it was a, it was a learning process and a get to know process. Um, and I've told this story before, but at one point Lisa said to me, if we don't let you do this, um, will you go ahead and write it anyway? Which is what I did with the George Lucas book. But um, but for Jim, you know, the problem with Jim is he didn't. George Lucas has been on the record forever and sits down for long interviews. Jim never really did that, um, and so it was really important to do it the way I wanted to do it. I really wanted it in his voice as much as possible. And I said, you know, the, I I don't think you could because the best way to do it is let him tell the story. And I don't think that he can tell the story unless I have access to the archives, because their archives are not at the University of Maryland or the University of Connecticut. They're privately held there at the Jim Henson Company. So you have to be inside the organization. Now, they may at some point donate them, I'm guessing. But um, so, you know, it, it, it was really important to me to have those archives and, and to have Jim's voice as much as I could. So, oh, at, you know, and, and the, <clears throat> I guess the exclamation point on the story is at one point I finally said this has been going on for about two years. And, uh, you know, it was hot and cold and it was yes, well, not yes, it's maybe. And then it was no, then it was back to maybe. And it just went round and round because you've got, you know, you had Jane and you had five kids and it was a big conversation with all of them within the company. And I finally said, you know, you guys are a Hollywood family. Let me audition for you. And now it wasn't an audition tape or anything like that. But um, <clears throat> so I went down to the Library of Congress. And that was another great thing about living there in D.C. is I went down to the Library of Congress and. You know, this is Jim's home base, remember? So I pulled every local newspaper from when Jim was in high school and in his freshman year of college when he was first doing Sam and Friends and when he first went down and got his job at WTOP in D.C. Um, and I pulled every newspaper article I could find um, from that time, and I wrote a chapter, like a mock-up chapter, on young Jim Henson and his fascination with television and going down to T.O.P. and getting that job and auditioning and then moving on to Sam and Friends. And I sent that to them, and um, and and that that was it. I mean, they wrote back and they, and they said, you, "We get it. We see how you want to do this." And what was really fascinating about that and really neat is um, 
they didn't they hadn't ever seen a lot of that, even though it was kind of hidden in plain sight in just the newspapers. Um, but I remember Lisa Henson loved the quote where somebody said the kid's absolutely a genius. Um, it was one of the <laughs> one of the people at WRC. So um, wow. so so once I had that in their hands and a lot of that chapter actually still sort of stayed intact in the book, actually. But once I had that in their hands, uh, you know, they could see how I wanted to do this. Um, we, you know, it was off to the races. And after that, it took about another three years to research and write the book. Wow. So how, how long total do you think everything, I mean, it, from, it was five you know, years. The, yeah, it was five years. Five years. Yeah. Wow. wow. Washington, the Washington Irving book came out in November of, uh, or January, I think of 2008 and Jim Henson came out in September of 2013. So, and I was already talking with them, I think even in 2008, so early in 2007. Oh, wow. That's... Now, since you, um, since you know, I mean, you've talked with the family and, you know, obviously, you know, you know, basically everything there is to know. Why do you think he wasn't very into doing interviews? I mean, do you think he just kind of just wanted to stray away from it? Or, I mean, well, I mean, Jim, you know, Jim never talked all, all that much. Like Jane did this great impression yeah. of the way she, you know, she said even when he, she and Jim would do interviews together when they were kids, you know, in teenagers and in college, she said they would sit down and Jim would like sink all the way down in his chair, you know, down <laughs> on his back with his arms crossed. And Jane would be the one doing all the talking. Jim just mm -hmm. more than anything, I don't think he resented being interviewed. Or anything. I think he just didn't talk all that much. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, it was, it was, and people didn't sit him down and have these long on the record conversations with him. You know, fortunately you've got moments when 60 minutes is there filming the Muppet show and Jim sits down on camera for that. And there's, there's some mm -hmm. neat moments where, you know, you see him sitting down and talking about, you know, the future of cable TV and some things like that, but there weren't a lot of long written interviews with him. There's that really good one that Judy, um, Oh, I can't think of her last name all of a sudden. Um, it's one of the really long ones where she was actually in the U.S. and called Jim in London while he was working on The Muppet Show. And it was almost midnight his time. Uh, and she mm -hmm. and she had him on the phone like 90 minutes. That's still one of the wow. longest and best interviews Jim did. And that interview is wow. actually – the transcript is in the Henson archives as well. That's pretty much the same as what you see online. But she had yeah. also done another interview um, around that time with Lauren Michaels. Um, wow. which never was published anywhere. So I had act by having the archives, I had access to that interview. Um, so you can, you know, so you could hear, so some of the, some of the voice that you get in the bio of Lauren Michaels was in that interview that's sitting there in the archives has never been released. So that was, so that was why having the archives were so key because there were so many documents like that. Um, it was great getting, you know, the internal memos Jim had been sending around the company. Uh, where, he, you know, he would actually sit down, I'm guessing, and and type them out, and then they would distribute them. And it was really helpful when I was writing the sections on the Jim Henson Hour and even the Disney deal, because you could get his thoughts, you know, about, you know, he said at one point that you know, NBC doesn't quite know what to do with us. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice show and it's not being given <laughs> oh, time. Yeah. So, you know, this was all internal memos he was sending around. So, so that was really where you could get his voice to come through was in a lot of those documents like that. And then, of course, the Red Book, although the Red Book is mostly just a list of significant events rather than voice. Um, yeah. But there is a time very briefly for about two weeks when he decided to keep a journal and then quickly got tired of that. Um, but but there's a very there's a very you know great moment in there when you get Jim sort of laying down. That's the one where he talks about how he loves to work more and, you know, working hard is better than a good meal and making a lot of money. And I don't understand why people don't like to work. And yeah. you're reading that going, well, because we're not doing them up it's all day man so yeah exactly so, so, but that's in his di in his private journal so and and some of that has come out but um but at the time i was doing it a lot of that info wasn't out there what's great now is is so much of what i had access to has now gotten out there through karen falk and various other people a lot of the uh, josh you and i were talking about this a little bit a lot of the the um the wilkin stuff wasn't around and now, no. and now almost all of it's out there, whether, whether it was, mm -hmm. whether it was actually put out by the Hensons or it got out, all the Wilkins stuff is now out there, which is great that people can see that. Wonderful. Um, at the time I was writing it, you know, they sent me a box. I, I think Craig Shemin was actually the one who put it all together. Uh, just sent me boxes of DVDs that I would just put in and just watch, you know, three hours worth of commercials and variety show yeah. appearances and stuff you couldn't get anywhere. So it's actually great mm -hmm. that a lot of that stuff's out there now. I, I love the, you know, the Dick Cavett appearance and all those kinds of stuff are out there to find now which is really great. The thing that I thought was so mm -hmm. crazy was we've been searching for this uh, appearance on the Johnny Carson show where Dr. Teeth, that was his first appearance. And then Johnny yeah. Carson YouTube channel is just like, yeah. there it is. Here you go. And it's like, what? Yeah. And, it, it, and I was, yeah, I'm with you. I was looking for that one day and I couldn't find, it. I was like, I know I've seen this before. Why is this not up? 
And yeah, that was, you just found it on the Carson page, just randomly put there. And it's not even like, it's kind of hard to find when you're even there. I was just like, it, it, that's mm-hmm. it. You just put you this thing that so many of us fans have been searching yeah. for. And whoop, there it is. It's like catastrophe music, man. Yeah. And it's... <laughs> oh my gosh. And then what did he say? He's like, I dig that fuzz. <laughs> Was not expecting that at all. I'm like, wow, this is, this is fun. Yeah, it, and, is fun. and you know, and, it, and it's a great example of Jim sitting there with the Muppets on his arm, and Jim's gone immediately. Like you're just yeah. watching the puppet. How about this? So, who is your favorite Muppet, Brian? Well, if you had asked me that before I started the book, it would have been Ernie because I was a Sesame Street kid. Um, yeah. And I had the, I think they were Fisher Price. I, we, my brother and I, my brother's three years younger than me. And we had the Ernie and Bert Fisher Price, you know, hand Muppets that had the, you know, the very stiff rubber heads. Yes. Um, and, and we, we love them. And um, I was always Ernie and my brother had to be the straight man. He, so he had Bert. Aww. And, and it was, uh, well, cause I was the older brother. So I got to be of the only one. And, <clears throat> and we loved the one, the 10 Q, 10 Q, 10 Q joke. Oh, goodness. But when you're when, when you're like, you know, five, <clears throat> you don't quite necessarily have a concept of even and odd numbers. So I always had to start with me at 10. I'd be 10 Q. And then we'd go back and forth. Nine, eight. So like we'd go backwards <laughs> to know to know who had to start so I could have the, the punchline on it. Um, so it, anyway, oh so I, I just I loved Ernie and Bert. Um, they were my fair. So I was I was a big Ernie guy. Um, and loved Grover. And again, it all came from being a Sesame Street kid. And even on through the Muppet Show era, um, you know, I, I always still kind of held on to to the, the, the Sesame Muppets. Once I got done researching Jim and writing the book, it was Rolf in a runaway at that oh, point. Yeah. I just I absolutely fell in love with that character. Uh, my mother was correct. He was on the Jimmy Dean show <laughs> uh, and the Jimmy and the Jimmy Dean segments. As, and you've seen them. I mean, the Jimmy Dean segments are brilliant. And those are more um, things that people are oh, finding. Yeah. I'm seeing like Jimmy Dean segments getting uploaded and like, where, where'd you find where that? are they coming from? Yeah. And, and they're, and they're yeah. like, they're just so genuinely warm. They are. And, and Jimmy Dean believes, and I even said this in the book, I mean, Jimmy absolutely believes in that character, um, which it's, it, it's both to the strength of Jim's performance, but also Jimmy Dean, like Jimmy oh, yeah. Dean is all in on it and it is absolutely charming. The, the Jimmy Deans are, are magnificent. And, um, when I talk about Jim, uh, when I, I do, my, I have a presentation I do on Jim and I always show the one where, um, where the, he's got the, they're, they're singing and, and Jim and Frank are trying to work Rolf with the straw hat. And, and I always explain to people, you know, it's like a two handed Muppet and I explain how that works a live hand. And so they're crouched down behind the wall and there's a choreography involved. And I said, just watch them trying to work with the straw hat and the audience, which clearly knows what's going on. And so there's the great moment when the hat falls off Rolf's head. And so Jimmy Dean takes his own hat off and puts it on Rolf. Oh. And then from behind, and then from behind the wall, here comes the hat and like Rolf hands it back up to, and the place just goes, <laughs> just goes nuts because they all know what's going on behind the wall, even though they can't see it. They just hand the hat back. It's, it is, it's a brilliant and hilarious moment. The Jimmy Dean stuff is gold. Um, so anyway, so I just, I absolutely fell in love with Rolf. And again, I still think Kermit gets all the glory, but Ralph does all the work. Yeah. Um, and I, and I think Rolf is really the one who's mm-hmm. the close, who is actually the closest to Jim's own personality, just because he's a little, he's a little more laid back. I mean, Jim can get that frantic, you know, frog 101, chaos 100 mentality, but he's a little bit more laid back. He's a little more homespun. And that, that to me seems to line up just a little bit more with Jim than Kermit does. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, um, like when, you know, with Walt Disney, it all started with a mouse. And for this, it's kind of like, oh, it all started with a frog. It's like, yeah, but it, I feel like it really started with a <laughs> yeah, dog. And, it, and, that, and I always ask that question again when I'm, you know, talking about Jim. I'm like, can anybody tell me who the first, you know, sort of nationally famous Muppet was? And I'm like, just shout it out. And people are like, Miss Piggy. You know, they're shouting stuff. And I'm like, no, okay, stop shouting. Rolf the dog. Rolf the dog. And, and, and people are just stunned that it's Rolf. Um, and the end that it's not Kermit. Kermit's the one everybody kind of expects, but I have to do, you know, again, I have mm-hmm. to do as you often do on your Twitter feed, Josh, I have to walk people through the history of Kermit <laughs> when he comes up and <sighs> you know, explain, explain, you know, what he looked like when he first came out and he, that he wasn't even green. He was blue and, um, you know, his feet weren't mm-hmm. flippers yet. And that he and, wasn't and, Wilkins. Yeah, and he's not Wilkins, right. Gosh. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't but, even uh, a frog. Right, yeah. and you could almost, almost not quite to the day, but to the month tag when he finally became that frog. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, and but anyway, so so Kermit at the time, even Rolf's on Jimmy Dean, isn't even quite a frog yet, even at that time. So. No, 
And, you know, you look at that, um, what is it? The Muppets on Puppets, one of those PBS specials that yeah. Jim did. And Rolf's the host of it. And Kermit shows up. And Rolf is like, oh, here's Kermit. Who, who cares? <laughs> Yeah. Well, and, and when they're doing the Sesame Street video, you know, when they're trying to promote, you know, sell the idea of Sesame Street, who is the host? Rolf. Yep. And Kermit is sort of the sideman for that, because, again, Rolf is the one everybody knows. Oh, how the t- times have changed, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and because Jim performed both characters, by mm-hmm. the time we get around to the Muppet Show, he's got to pick one. Yeah. And uh, and it, and and it should have been Kermit, yeah. of course. But of course. I, I love yeah, I love even Jane Hence. And I use this quote in the book poor like, when I was when I was interviewing her. She sort of shook her head sadly at me and said, poor Rolf. But like you look at the Rolf segments on The Muppet Show and it's some of the best stuff. My favorite is the um, the poem about the butterfly. <laughs> well, and I mean, and he and Sam doing tit willow. I mean, it didn't. Oh, get any yes. Better than that. Oh, so um, when you were doing all your research, what do you think is like the most like surprising or like shocking thing that you found out about Jim or just anything? So a number of things. I mean, first of all, I think people are uh, shocked to find out how he had an sort of inability to remain faithful to Jane, um, which I know people are very surprised at. And their relationship is so interesting it is uh Mm -hmm. and and, you know and the and the first person who ever told me about the relationship was jane you know the first person i sat down with (laughs) um so it wasn't anything that was any great secret and everybody had a story um but i think as fans it was something we'd never really heard before we never really got that side of it um you know it was referenced a little bit after jim died they talked about her you know her him calling her and how you know they discussed their marriage and so on but um but, you know, that was, I think, a moment that we as fans didn't necessarily know that side of it. Um, I think I think another one was, um, you know, Jim as a businessman. I don't think we all really appreciate it because we see him and we're like, he's, a, you know, he's a hippie. He's laid back. He's, you know, and Jim was wasn't a cutthroat businessman because Jim didn't have that capability, but was a really mm-hmm. good businessman. Yeah. And, you know, and, and from the time he was young and, you know, and, and, and it's that, that moment when he turns to Bernie Brillstein and, and says, Bernie, never sell anything that I own. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a pivotal moment right there because because they're going to I mean, the, the dog food company is going to pay him a lot of money to own Rolf outright. Yeah. And and Brillstein's like, you're crazy to not take this. And Jim's like, don't sell anything. I own." Jim knew his work had value. Um. And but then beyond that, again, was really extraordinarily good businessman. You know, watch that bottom line. And and, um, you know, when the company starts to grow, I mean, his company almost starts to grow exponentially. And that's the moment, I think, you know, when he when the Jim Henson show starts to kind of go off the rails. Part of that is because like that company is just doing so many things. Yeah. And it's growing very quickly that it, it's hard for Jim to kind of hold it all together. And I think that's, you know, a, a big part of what prompted him to want to go to the Disney company and have them sort of running that business side of it. Yeah. So, so, so Jim as a businessman was, was a narrative I did not expect. Um, again, because when you see him, you're like, he's, he's hippy dippy and, and he's not going to be a great, a really great businessman with great instincts. The, the last thing I think that shocked me was just how, how, you know, kind of in the same, in the same area is, it's just how conflict averse he could be. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and, and part of it comes from the fact that he's genuinely a nice guy. And that's one of the things that I love about Jim is he really is the way you want him to be. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and like, can't, can't fire people. You know, there's a great story about him and David laser trying to tag team Richard hunt at one point. And, uh, and Jim just can't, can't play the bad cop in it. Give them a hug. Um, yeah, yeah, it just gives him a hug. And you know, David Laser's like, come on, man, I set this thing up. You know, I had to be the bad guy. <laughs> and so, you know, Jim, but Jim can't, he just, he can't do it. He, 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 and Laser's the one who says to him, Jim, you have to stop calling this a family. You can't fire family. Um, but Jim just couldn't do it. So, yeah. you know, and, 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 but again, it conflict averse to the point that he won't fight with Jane. You know, Jane is the kind that really wears her heart on her sleeve and wants to have these, you know, heavy discussions that probably would have been good for them. Um, and Jim just can't do it. It just he's he just is not built for that kind of conflict. Yeah. Yeah. When I was uh, when I was reading some of that, I was like, wow, why does this sound so familiar? And then I like learned from it. I'm like, maybe that's not the best thing to just kind of like keep it in and just like just kind of like deal with your, you know, just deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you and you run into some of those heartbreaking moments, you know, like when they're they're going to decorate the apartment, and Jane is, you know, throwing out ideas on how to decorate, and Jim says, 
yeah, you know, I think I'm just going to do it myself. And like, and Jane even says like, she knows that's mm-hmm. the end right there. Um, because that's as, you know, as, as in her face as Jim is really going to get. Yeah. So on that happy note, I was going to ask Brian, <laughs> what is your favorite Muppet production? I know there have been so many and you've, probably researched the hell out of all of them but what would you say is your favorite muppet production <sighs> favorite of production so of the three movies i i actually like um muppets take manhattan the best oh. i think I, I think it's the i think it's the funniest one um i think partly probably because oz is at the helm of that 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 tends to come through i think a little more it's a little it's a little crazier i love the idea in that one that you've got the muppets playing characters yeah as well like they're not playing mm-hmm. themselves there's something very odd and very cool about that so of the movies i really like that um as far as the, the different projects i i am a sucker for emmett otter oh um, yes it was oh, that was one of it? that was one of those productions that i read about in I don't even remember what magazine it was when I was a kid and it was like, Oh, and it's on HBO. And I'm like, I'll never get to see it. It's like, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, but I remember reading about that because there was a picture of Kermit on a bike in it. And I was just like, Oh my God, I want to see this so bad. And I was like, I'll never, ever, ever get to see this. There was a great picture of all the Muppet performers around the, you know, the river bottom nightmare band in the car, you know, just going nuts. And, and it just, I mean, I, I wanted to see that so badly the moment I even saw the first teasers for yeah. it. So I, I have a huge soft spot for Emmett Otter. The other one that I didn't know anything about until I started doing the research for this. And it, again, it showed up as a DVD um, is Muppet family Christmas. Um, oh I, my gosh. I, I think uh, again, if it comes to, if it comes down to a vote, I'm taking Emmett Otter, but wow. Muppet family Christmas. What a gem. For real. Um, I don't know why I just got chills when you said that. Cause I was hoping you were going to mention it at some point. Cause that is like my all time favorite, like end all be all the one Muppet thing I could watch. Cause it's everybody. It's the whole, it's everybody. It, 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 it's like Marvel and DC and star Wars. Like everything comes yeah. together in it, you know, like it's the like, ultimate crossover. Yeah. You've got, ironically, you know, you've got... the only thing missing is Emmett Otter. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And and it would have been kind of cool if they could have forgot to get like, you know, Agra maybe from the Dark Crystal in there somehow. But <laughs> have the um, land of Gorch just... people show up. <laughs> land of Gorch, Throw them in great. the basement with the fraggles, just <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh but but it is uh, it is the the sleeper hit i think among all of his work it, I, it is gorgeously done it is a huge shame that you can't find it anywhere with the songs in it now um because of you know YouTube. Music. <clears throat> you, yes it, no if josh you officially mm-hmm. can't find it anywhere with the songs on it you legally um, cannot <laughs> find it anywhere. there you go um but it i it is muppet history does not endorse the pirating or watching on youtube of muppet specials unless disney just really doesn't release them in which they probably won't ever so you know what go ahead there you go but it is it it is anyway. It is to me. It is. I am so glad to hear Madison is on my team on this. I think it is. It is their. It is. It is their. It is their. Their finest hour. Again, if push oh. comes to shove, you're going to make me vote for it like an NCAA tournament, and it's Christmas and it's Christmas specials. I'm given. I'm giving Emmett my pick. But wow, <laughs> it's Muppet Family Christmas, fantastic. It really is. Wait, what do you guys mean though that you can't find it without the music? Are you saying like on a like a hard copy? The or official DVD releases have edits to the songs, so like some of the closing medley and then some of the other stuff was cut out. So was there a DVD? Yeah, there's been. Yeah, two, I, I think. Oh, yeah. okay. Because I, I, yeah, I was gonna say because I know I have it on uh, VHS and it has most of everything. But uh, yeah, I was going to say, I because it's it's so sad that you can't, you know, get that out of anything. And that would be something great to have, you know, Disney put on there for a special for Disney Plus. But I mean, that's all we've been talking about is we want everything on there. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that's one where you're going to have jurisdictional, you know, discussions mm-hmm. because you've got Sesame in there. Yep. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So. And the Fraggles. Well, but true. So it's like you've got all three. You've got the you know the three houses. You've got the Hensons and Sesame and Disney. Mm-hmm. And all yeah, those. yeah. Now, if you were gonna rank, uh, I mean, the three main movies, if you had to put them in order. Oh no so problem. I, do... I, I I do this one easily. Muppet Take Manhattan, Muppet Movie, uh, Great Muppet Caper. That I, I I it's boy Muppet okay. Caper. I saw so I saw it in the theater again when it came out. I I am just well. I'm gonna catch so much crap for this. I am not a I am not a huge Miss Piggy fan, and that movie is like and that movie is like 
piggy overload uh, for me. And so I, it's, it's one of those where I'm like, oh, God, here she comes to save the day again. And I, I mean, I get it. Like she was on the yeah. cover of magazines at the time. She was their breakout star. It, it's it's I'm it, it's a little too much piggy. Yeah, that's funny because I'm also team not piggy. I have some very strong opinions about her, but Caper is probably my favorite. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know. But I think. I mean, they're all they're all clever, and they all have, they all use their guest stars very very wow. well. But mm-hmm. uh, it's the piggy, just like one. we apparently. Yeah. yeah, the piggy, the piggy, the the piggy angle is one that sends that one to the back of the line. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. Now, what do you think about the new movies? Truthfully, uh, you know, I I I think they're okay. Um, the first one's better than the second one. <laughs> <laughs> um. I actually, you know, it's funny. I went back and I was doing another podcast, and we were discussing the the Muppets, like the the re, the reboot of the TV show. And I had actually not watched most of it. I think I watched the first two when it came out, and then I just never got around to watching it. So I went back and watched all of them in like two sittings, and I actually thought they were great. Um, but I think I think that you only think that if you sit and watch them all in mm-hmm. a row, because because you can see them figuring it out. As they're going right. along, I totally agree with that. Um, you you can see why ABC started to lose patience with it, and I think you can see why viewers started to lose faith. But if you sit down and you watch the entire series from end to end, um, it, it actually holds together, and yeah. and, the, and the conceit is starting to work. And and the turning point on it is the moment when they kind of throw up their hands and they're like, you know what, everybody's on the show, yeah. and and that's the moment right there that it starts to work. Yeah. Because yeah. as soon as you do that, it's now the Muppet Show. Mm-hmm. Because you know it's like the shenanigans backstage with everybody. It's not just about Miss Piggy. It's not just about Kermit. It's about the entire gang, and and that's the moment when it works. When they bring in like the consultant, like like that's when the switch Pache. gets flipped, and that and yeah, and that show starts to kind of take off. I think had they I think had they given them uh, a couple more episodes or maybe one more season, they would have figured it mm-hmm. out. Especially because Bill Barrett is so oh, funny. In, in that oh, he thing. is. He's he's, he's a wonderful. genius. I think the same thing happened with Muppets Tonight, honestly, where they were just trying to do the Muppet show again. And then when they were like, well, maybe we should just try and like tell stories with these characters. That's when it all fell through. Yeah. And, and you know, it's it's really tough um, because uh, I was having this conversation with somebody else where, you know, character is king with the Muppets. And you can't just take them. I mean, I, I love the party game where we're all like, name a movie. Take everybody out, leave one person in, and the rest are Muppets. Like That's it's not really, how the Muppets it, work. It, it's an awesome game, but it doesn't it doesn't always work. Like it, it did on like Treasure Island. Like you got to pick. Yeah. It. Um, but you know the the characters drive the conceit, not the other way around. You can't be like, you know, it'd be funny. Let's do the Office with the Muppets, which is kind of what the Muppets yeah. was, the TV show. Yeah. Um, and it's like you can't you can't retrofit it that way. You kind of got to go off the Muppets to be like, what's funny with them. That's and, why it works with classic literature. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I think like I'm I'm actually <laughs> like I I could probably get behind a Great Gatsby. I think I could probably get behind that one because because again that was very character driven. Like the mm-hmm. the Gatsby story is all about like the you know the relationship between all the main characters. Yeah. Um, so I could get behind that. But anyway, so that's so that's the issue with them. Like you really have to be careful because it's the characters are driving the narrative, not the other way mm-hmm. around. You can't just say it would be funny if we did this with them. You you can't it, let's put them in this in this format. You've got to you've got to really figure that out. I th- and I mean I think we even see Jim himself figuring that out with his first Muppet pilot. Mm-hmm. What's yeah. gonna work? What's gonna work best here? You know what's the best format? He's he's circling it in every pilot. And then finally sticks the landing when he gets, you know, what we now know is the Muppet Show. But he's he's always kind of circling that setup and doesn't ever quite get it right. Honestly, the thing that I've been hearing a lot that people think is this funny idea is people will be like, what if we put Miss Piggy in a movie, but she's just Miss Piggy. She's not like people treat her like she's, you know, not a Muppet. And I was like, you mean a Muppet movie? (laughs) <laughs> I mean, they're like no like they don't like she's actually like they treat her like she's just an actress like a muppet movie yeah, no what i if mean would have what if you would have put her in like the devil wears prada and given her like the meryl streep role i mean she could have done that it point, she could have but at that point it becomes a miss piggy movie exactly i think that's the issue is it becomes more distracting yeah i i, I agree it would but be i think funny. you could do like <laughs> i think you could do a like a bridesmaid style comedy with a Miss Piggy in it, As and one it of the would work. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. But I mean, she's who knows? 
and you can, I don't know. I feel like she, it might just be me. And again, not the biggest fan, but I'll give her this compliment. I feel like she works the best with humans, with like other, you know, like her, just seeing, I feel like. They gave, because again, it's character. They've, you know, Frank Oz called her, you know, the, the, the truck driver who thinks she's a super mom. <laughs> Well, and, you know, so it's like that personality is just so strong that you can make it work in a lot of stuff. You know, Mike Frith tells a great story about, um, you know, sort of, again, at the height of her powers that they had some magazine called some fitness magazine yeah. or life or something. And they're like, we want to do a photo shoot with Miss Piggy. And I think maybe Bonnie told the story, too. But um, and, and they're like, we want to do a photo shoot with Miss Piggy. And, you know, we want to have her like, you know, on the beach and running on the beach and, you know, do all this stuff. And, and so, you know, first, like, OK, well, we got to come out. We'd have to we need to dig the trench for that. And he's going down all the mechanics of it. And they're like, why, why do you have to do that? And first, like, she can't just run on the beach. Like she was so convincing that people thought Miss Piggy, you could just hire her and she would show up and just start walking around. They, you know, you forget that mm -hmm. like Frank Oz has to come out and you've got to put him down and, you know, dig a hole for him to go down and do it and so on. So it was the power of that character. Like they could do a photo puppet, but at the same time, it's like, mm -hmm. it's going to look like it's a, it's going to look more like a painting as opposed to a picture. It's not like they're going to just, you know, do the whole suit, like in a uh, great Muppet caper, like when she's on the bike yeah, or, you, can't, you know, it, like when she's roller skating, she's jumping off that rock yeah, in, in you, uh, Manhattan. Like, I mean, that's, if that's the case, she's not going to look the best. Right. So like, yeah, I mean, you, but, you, you, but you can't hire Piggy for an hour photo, you know, to do a photo shoot because you're going to bring Oz in and you got to, you got to bring in the costumers and you got to bring in the Muppet, yeah. you know, first aid people to, you know, tape them up if something happens. And uh, that's just not enough time. I mean, <laughs> probably. Yeah. And she just charges way too much anyway. So, yeah. And two, I think it's, I think it helps too that, uh, Frank had just, I mean, he had so much backstory with her, like the whole thing about like how, you know, she was like raised it, you know, like what was it? She was like raised in the sty and then she, her mother was killed in a, in a farm accident. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. It's some tragic backstory, like abandoned by her father or something. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and she made money by entering contests, which then kind of makes it into the Muppet movie a little bit. But yeah, Oz, Oz always did that. Um, you know, he's got a great one for um, Sam the Eagle, and he's got a really great one for Marvin Suggs and how he locks all his Muppet phones up in these rusty cages. <laughs> you know, he's got just great backstory. And I think it was Dave Goals who said, you know, because of Oz doing that, he said he tried to do it and he was like, nah. Just, I think you know. what Dave ended up doing, he, he said, he was like, I just took a part of myself, like one of my insecurities, and I made that a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, somebody like Richard Hunt. Richard Hunt was just not into that. Like he just didn't. He just didn't see the see the point. <laughs> you know, Richard just and wanted, you look wanted at his a... characters, and they are kind of, for lack of a better word, one dimensional. But yeah, I mean, Richard they work mm -hmm. in that way. Richard, you, Richard just yeah. wants a puppet on his arm so he can go nuts. And and that was it. I mean, Oz has the greatest description of him in the bio where he says he was a force of nature. And that is absolutely Richard Hunt to a T. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I wish I wish Richard got as just so much more attention than he does. Like people will be like, oh, yeah, Richard Hunt. Who's who's that? And I'm like, Beaker, mm -hmm. uh, all these Statler and all these characters. And he's like, he like, just what? seems like one of the most interesting people ever and it's just so sad that we don't have we don't really have a lot on him you well know? and i mean openly gay at a time when people just yeah. were not openly gay and like mm -hmm. everybody knew it and nobody cared which is really you know very much jim henson and the gang they just didn't care yeah. um you yeah. know and, and also you know richard hunt was notorious for you know his his love of the the ganja <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. and yeah. it, I think it's John Henson who told just this hilarious story about how when they were all on vacation together, Richard was with them. And John j thought Richard was just the coolest guy and wanted to hang out with him constantly. And mm -hmm. Jim told Richard, he's like, you know, I don't I don't mind you smoking pot, Richard, but just like don't do it in front of the kids and don't do it on the boat. I guess they were renting a boat. And so Richard would get off the boat and he would like climb up this hill. And go sit on top of the hill to go smoke smoke pot. And John was always like, "I want to go up there with Richard." I want to go with Richard. And Jim was like, "Why don't you just let Richard chill out just a little bit?" Yeah, <laughs> Richard has is is uh, that's, he's having some me time. <laughs> he's got to have his own vacation and his vacation. Yeah, I mean, I just remember saying talking with uh, Frank Oz at one point about you know about Jerry Nelson and, and Richard and you know and. I, we were talking about you know people thinking like the Muppets were all on all the performers were on drugs because of like yeah. you know the land of gorge and so on. Oh boy, uh, if I had a nickel for every time I hear when yeah. the only when the only ones that were were in uh, and I said Richard and Jerry and Oz looks at me and goes duh. 
I, I got to tell you, I loved having a drug story for the book um, because it does let you it does let you talk about, you know, that big mm-hmm. that that rumor that always persisted again, especially with Land of Gorge um, yes. and, and with Land of Gorge. It probably was drug fueled because it wasn't Jim and company writing. It It was actually the SNL writers writing it. I actually tried to get Al Franken to talk to me about that and he wouldn't. Um, uh, but uh, but anyway, I, I you know, it was actually re- very helpful to have the LSD story in the book. Because, you know, when everybody wants to talk about gym and drugs, you can at least point them right to that one. And I mm-hmm. love and I love the punchline of that story, which is for Jim, it doesn't do anything because mm-hmm. people take LSD to go to other worlds. And Jim was already there, like just didn't need the extra help. Yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't just doesn't work for some people. It's just not people's vibe sometimes. Nope. And it's just cool because it, make, it makes it more real because it's I'm sure there's. You know, there were people that are like, oh my gosh, like he, you know, he had to have done something. So it just kind of, it's, it's good. Like you said, it, it solidifies it. So. Yeah. And it, and it gives you the story to point to. And I mean, and, and that was another one that I, I saw that story in the transcript of an interview with somebody and it was like, well, I gotta, I gotta verify this. Mm-hmm. So, you know, so that's one of those where I'm trying to track everybody down that was involved with it. Cause when I, when I, first time I saw it, it was, it was like a third person you know, story. Like it wasn't somebody who was there. It was like, I heard. So I was like, well, I got to find out. So anyway, I managed to find, well, the only, the only people left, well, Jerry, Jerry was there and, and Frank were both there. So I, I actually asked both of them about it and they both confirmed it. So as a biographer, <laughs> that's the stuff you love. It's like, you've got a rumor, you've got a story that you really want to be true. And mm-hmm. you got to find the people who were in the room where it happened, as they say. And I found two of them and they both confirmed it. So that was so great <laughs> and really fun to track that down. That's awesome. It is. Who are your favorite Muppet Show guest stars? Um, my top five list has about a hundred people on it. Um, <laughs> so um, probably my big ones are, of course, the Star Wars one. I love oh, yeah. Steve Martin, uh, Elton John, Alice Cooper. Um, I love the Brooke Shields one because I love Alice in Wonderland and I love the way that like their version of Alice goes off the rails so quickly. It makes it so great. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm so sad that that's one of the very few episodes that's not up right now. Um, and, but I got to tell you, you know, uh, uh, when I was, so somebody asked me on Twitter at one point, did you watch all, you know, all the episodes of the Muppet show when you're researching the book? And my answer to that was no, I had watched the Muppet show in first run as a kid. So like, I know, I know yeah. what it's about. I don't need to familiarize myself with the setup or the conceit or anything like that. Um, so I had watched enough that I didn't feel like I need to go back and watch every single one of them. So, mm-hmm. but it's actually been really fun now that they're on Disney sitting down some evenings and like, I'm going to watch two of these. And, and I was tweeting them one night, yeah. like I, I watched, um, I can't, I think it was the Arlo, I think Arlo Guthrie. I think Josh, I think you even checked in on it at one point, like, like the, uh, there, it, it was the Arlo Guthrie who just looks like he would rather be any place else the entire time he's doing it. It's just, you know, it's just, it's so much fun watching these episodes and they're like such a snapshot of the seventies sometimes with some of these guests mm-hmm. Like people are like, who's Mac Davis, you know? Uh, you know, Kenny Rogers, yeah. you know, I guess Kenny Rogers is a little more timeless, but it's just so interesting. You know, yeah. Cheryl Ladd, you know, you, you get just mm-hmm. all these sort of like point in time references. Wally Boak. Wally Boak, yeah, it's still, oh but it's still gosh. really fun to watch. It is. Um, you know, J- John Cleese, I love the John Cleese episode. Gilda Radner, the Gilda Radner episode is one of my favorite ones. So, uh, so here I go. There's my top five that I already have probably <laughs> 10 in them, but those are the, those are the ones yeah. I've watched a lot. Now, let me ask you this, since we're talking Muppet Show, um, and I don't know if you, I don't remember if it was in the book at all, but who is this guest that everyone keeps saying that they were an absolute pain, and it was just like the worst, like, do, do you know, like, who, I mean, because I've heard it mentioned multiple times from multiple people that worked on the show, and they never want to say no. I think I know, and I can't remember now all of a sudden. It, I think it's an, and I'm not, I'm not being coy. Um, I think it's yeah. an old school person. Part of me, I, okay. I've my guess has always been. Um, Did you say Liberace? No, no, Li- Liberace. Jim just couldn't believe what a bad pianist he was. I think he was a fine. I think he was a fine guest, but um, it, it was somebody. It, it was not this person, but it was. It was somebody along the lines of like a Milton Berle. Yeah, like one of one of those. 
I feel like I thought it was. I've always thought it was Harvey Corbin. Oh, really? See, I hadn't. I don't remember hearing that one. I, I was. Yeah. I always thought it was a little more. And now I watch these episodes, and I'm always trying to because you can always like the Mark Hamill episode. You can tell how much that is the happiest boy in the world. He's having the time of his life. This is like his dreams just oh came God. true. Like you know, like you know, greatest thing ever. But then sometimes you can kind of just like get this vibe. It's like you don't want to be there. Do well, you? Again, the Arlo Guthrie one. Just watch, yeah. watch him. He, like he's sitting, just he's miserable. sitting there at the time, and he gets done, and he's looking around like, "How did I get here?" <laughs> yeah. I gotta fire my, oh my publicist. Uh, but it. you know, Alice, Alice so Cooper. Funny. Like Alice Cooper's brilliant in it. Like another person that you who would you, who would have expected that and absolutely cut out for the Muppets. Mm-hmm. It's the people who it it goes back to the whole Jimmy Dean thing. It's the people who truly believe the the characters that they're real. and embrace it. And the people who are like, I want to take advantage of this. I want to I want to go all out. I want to do something crazy. I want to do something I couldn't go on Johnny Carson and be like, hey, can I balance a spoon on my nose? And it's like uh, I want to. S- I'm an opera singer. Can I sing a country song? <laughs> yeah, it's like, tap dance. Sure, Probably so it. is tap dancing. Um, yeah, but I, th- I think you, you know, you have to have a sense of humor about yourself, which again is why I think the Arlo yeah. Guthrie one probably doesn't work as well. Um, because it, I mean, when you think about it, you are sitting there in a sea of puppets, and you know everything that's going on is going on beneath you, um, literally. So, um, so you know, it, it takes I think a certain type to really get into the Muppet groove. I think you know Gilda Radner is another perfect example for somebody who just rolls with it. And, and yeah, just another and Steve Martin. Yeah, yeah, another guy just rolled just a fantastic mm-hmm. episode. Uh, so you know, and I don't think it necessarily is comedians only. Um, you know, because like Chris, I was like, going to say Christopher Reeve. I, that was the one I was to say. Christopher Reeve's episode is brilliant uh, for that reason. Mm-hmm. Even like, kind of Buddy Rich in a way. He kind of he works well with them. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Rita Moreno. Yes, abs- Oh, absolutely. Raquel yeah. Welch. How well she worked with Fozzie on that. Oh man. <laughs> well, that's that's another one I love. There's a you know David Laser tells that great story where you know she wanted to wear the spider dress and David Laser says essentially no one was going to tell her no to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. who, who do you think would have like back then? Who do you think would have worked for the Muppet Show that they never ended up getting on or like like somebody who maybe like you know, they wanted to, but you know, they just couldn't work it out or just somebody who would have just worked. Um, I love that they really wanted the entire Python cast. Um, another person that they put had on their wish list, who I think would have been great was Michael Caine. Um, oh yeah. Oh, you know, even, wow. even, even the Full 19, circle. even the 1970s version of Michael Caine would have been fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, I love that they actually made a legit run at trying to get a Beatles reunion on the show. I mean, and I think if there was any show that could have done it, it was probably them. But uh, mm-hmm. um, so that would have been fun. But um, who else at the time? Um, you know, Dutton- boy, I sure wish they could have gotten Richard Pryor. Yeah, boy. <laughs> um, that would have been interesting. That would have just blown up. Been- oh, you stop. Um, but that, but that would have, been- but it would have been interesting because here comes somebody that like you associate with being like filthy. And now comes on to this show, you know. On a tip, yeah. What about how about George Carlin? I mean, George Carlin would have been awesome. Oh there, my gosh, that would have been incredible. I mean, and you even see some of these like uh, these guests, and you know, that do those little spots on Sesame Street. It's like, and obviously, it's for the parents. You know, it's like, oh, I know who that is. But sometimes I'm like, man, you've done some some crazy stuff. I mean, not crazy, but um, I'm trying. To- Richard Pryor was on Sesame Street. Yeah, he was. That's true. That's true. Weren't they trying to get Frank Zappa on there? Because I think he would have been absolutely perfect. Um, I don't remember. It wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me. That that seems right out of Oz's playbook. Yeah, because that's something that sounds familiar, and that's where I like thought of it. My my favorite comment that I've gotten are was someone who was like, "I've gone through the Disney Plus list, and I can't find the episode with OJ Simpson." Oh my gosh! <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I think they cut that one." <laughs> right <laughs> no, but but i did lo- you know i love the fact that by the time they get to seasons four and five they could get pretty much anybody they wanted you know people falling oh, yeah. over themselves trying to get on the show mm-hmm. um that was how they got kenny rogers you know kenny rogers sent a telegram it's basically like i'd oh. be great i'd be great on the show take me take me mm-hmm. then did you did you see the did you see the bit on twitter one day too when uh julian lennon was talking about oh, i'm sorry sean lennon was talking about how he and john lennon used to watch the muppet show in their apartment in new york no 
That's, oh yeah, I, I I think someone like sent it to me, and I was yeah, like, it was really good. But he so said he'd get so mad because when the commercial came on, John would turn the TV off, and you know because he didn't want to see the commercials. And I actually said something like, um, "Oh, oh right. gosh, I would bet he like would just turn the volume down." And Sean actually responded to me and was like, "No, he turned it off," and he said he would get so annoyed because then he would forget to turn it back oh. on. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, I just missed three minutes of this, man. Who does that? So, but there's what I love again. Like, who could have made a run at the Beatles? Mm-hmm. Probably the Muppets. Yeah. And you know, I mean, God, George George Harrison would have been a natural with them anyway. And it, it just I'm looking. I found a list of Muppet Show potential guests. Tony Bennett was proposed. Well, they eventually did. they got him. So for which was that was probably my. I would say that's like my favorite. I'm, uh, I'm surprised me, none of us have said it. Robin Williams. Oh, oh yeah. Oh man. Yeah, even back then he would have been a great get. Oh yeah. Cuz I mean he was the wild man. Cuz when um when was Mork and Mindy on? I mean, I know that was the 70 78 70, right around that time. Yeah, 78. Okay. He, yeah, cuz he was doing stand up before then. So Yeah, it was all it was right at the right time. That that's actually now that I think about it, I'm like, wow, why didn't they get Robin Williams? Mhm. John Ritter I think would have been good. Cuz I mean would have been good. He's he's a human muppet, I think. I mean, just watch. I mean, he's so physical too. Like I mean, Three's Company was like, that's like what I watched as a kid was The Muppet Show, Alf, Three's Company, and like Facts of Life. Like, <laughs> Facts I of mean, life. that was. <laughs> I grew up on Night Court. Yeah, see, no, Facts of Life, Charlotte Ray would have probably been pretty good on The Muppet Show. Mm-hmm. I actually, when I was little, I couldn't tell the difference between Charlotte Ray and Ethel Merman for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. So I was like, oh, that's her. Wait, it's not. No, different lady. <laughs> Um, I found uh, Jim Henson's list of dream guests, and the first five of them are just other puppeteers, like the like Stan Freeburn, Burb Tilstrom, all the people he grew, he was inspired by. It would have been so great to get Stan Freeburn. So it was like, it was like it. That's what I think Jim would have wanted to do, or wanted to do, was to get these people who were kind of not in the spotlight anymore or never were and just kind of give them that. Well, and that, 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 that kind of, be, that kind of becomes those, you know, those specials Jim would do on the, you know, arts of different kind of puppetry. Oh yeah. Um, you know, that sort of, sort of that crept into that, but you know, I mean, he's got, you know, they did get Edgar Bergen on there who was kind of, as I said in the bio, that, was kind, of, that, that was kind of their Elvis when they got Edgar Bergen on. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can you can definitely see that he would have wanted uh, you know the old school puppeteers, and it, and it's so funny because Jim's tastes were a little old. They were very old school anyway. Some of the guests you know, like Mae West. When I was like Mae West, mm-hmm. you know, why don't you get the Marx Brothers instead? Even though they were all pretty old by that time. One aspect of Jim that really your book opened my eyes to was just how Jim wanted to help people in any way he could. Like you look at those, uh, that series of videos, the, oh, what are they called? Like the Jim Henson's play along series, I guess was oh, what yeah. it was called. And it's all mm-hmm. stuff focused mainly at children as their audience, but it's teaching them things. It's not educational in the sense of the alphabet or numbers, but more so things like how to skip, how to skip stones. Skip down, yeah. Exactly. And things like that, things you can do with, stuff you just find around your house and that's the aspect of Jim that I find so interesting. Yeah, that was and that's was very that. much his you know his mentality. Like if you go back to look at the Muppets on Puppets special from the uh late sixties, early seventies, somewhere around they're showing you how to make, you know, puppets out of plastic spoons and you know just just yes. how to make how to entertain yourself with, you know, found items. And just so encouraging. Like, hey, if you don't get it right the first time, that's what the next time's for. Exactly right. Yep. Yep, Jim always wanted to just do good. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, people like to, okay, who are the the icons of goodness in this world? You have Fred Rogers, LeVar Burton, all these. And it's like Jim Henson belongs in there as just being encouraging. You oh, know, for sure. and for trying sure, to yeah. be, and just in try something different try anything really. it's and you know and it's it's such a tragedy that we lost him so early it would have been you know fascinating to see what he did 
Um, and just, you know, he would have become, not that he's not an icon anyway, but, you know, looking at like Fred Rogers mm-hmm. as he got older and was always like the voice of sanity. And, you know, it's like no matter how nuts it got, if he stepped in and said something, everybody stopped and listened. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I feel like we don't really have anybody like him anymore. I mean, I'm sure we do, but not, nothing that like stands out, you know? But the problem is whenever we do have someone who's like Jim Henson or like Fred Rogers, the first thing people want to do is, okay, but what's wrong with them? Okay, but why did they mess up? Mm-hmm. Okay, what's their... Right, like, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Rogers Mr. Rogers being the, being the sniper yeah, in oh, Vietnam. Yeah. When he had big tattoos on his arms, that's yeah. why he wore sweaters. Just And that's just so frustrating because you try to talk about these people and it's like they don't... They want to know what their faults were before they recognize well you know and that was that was part of the issue with um you know writing about jim henson is you know there were people who were like after the book came out were like well this is this is like borderline you know like hagiography because nobody's that nice and um and i actually i I always feel like such a douche when i say this because i actually i said this to frank oz i would say (laughs) i would say sinatra told me not to name drop um but i always say this to, to, to frank oz i once said you know it's so disappointing to me when people are disappointed when their idols don't disappoint them yeah, um, because Jim doesn't disappoint you, and there were people who were like, "Well, I mean, this mm-hmm. book can't be true because Jim's not disappointing." <laughs> you, I mean, I'm sure you know about this whole biopic thing that's supposedly happening now. Do you think because he wasn't really a disappointment, there would be? I mean, because there obviously was conflict in his life, but I don't think there really was enough for there because, you know, I mean, for them to make, um, oh, sorry, um, for them to make a biopic like that, I feel like there's just, there has to be some kind of big conflict. How do you think that would work? Like, you know, if they actually- Well, I mean, you can, you can pick your narrative. One of the things I was hearing is they were saying it was going to be all about him trying to bring the Muppet show to TV, which I guess you could do. I mm-hmm. mean, that's sort of, a, you know, that's, that's a pretty good narrative arc in that it's- It'd be two hours of going to different studios and saying, hey, look what we've got here. Oh, Bill needs to see that. Yeah. Okay. And, and- yeah, the story Oz tells, or some other Uh-oh. guy would come in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, you know, but it's it, it's a real story of stick to itiveness. I don't know you can do it for two hours. No. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, it, you know, it depends on the narrative framing of it. I guess I'm not going to say it can't be done, but I feel like the best way they could approach it is something along the lines of the uh, Tom Hanks Mr. Rogers movie, where it's not a movie about Mr. Rogers; it's a movie with him in it where he's a part of it exactly where Mm -hmm. he is he just happens to be a part of the story and that could i mean you could make a biopic about sesame street being created and you could have yeah i mean so so i'm trying to remember because i read the script for muppet man um which is oh god so it's it's like i need to get it's it's cleverly done it's not accurate because at the time there was no bio (laughs) um so so they were they were spitballing some of it but i mean uh, it's, I can I can see how it could be done sort of that way where it's like you know you you fade in and out of having um, flashbacks told through like Muppet narratives which you could you know I, I mean you could do something like that it's it's very cleverly done whether you think it's done well is another question but it's sort of cle- it's got a it's got a clever setup um, so you know you might you might you might get some mileage out of that I I just don't know and I I from what I read they were sort of using. Muppet Man is a springboard. I don't think they were going to redo it, but they were using the, sort of maybe that maybe that framing mechanism. I don't know. Honestly, I'd rather, and no offense to Jim, but I'd rather see a biopic about Richard Hunt. Yeah, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. No, that these kinds of things come up all the time and being Muppet fans, we're used to, oh, there's going to be a special this Christmas. No, there's not. What special? You know, I mean, it, it lets us all do the, the parlor game mm, yeah. and of, you know, the ideal casting, but David it, Cross it, is it, Frank Oz. Yeah, it takes an awful. I mean, there's an awful. It takes an awful lot of collaboration and cooperation uh, to do this this right. And you know, I mean, I'm not going to say it can't be done, mm-hmm. but with and Disney, who owns the world, if anybody can do it, they they probably can. So. Yeah. Although, again, I'm always, I'm always so fascinated, and uh, I think you and I have talked about this a little bit, Josh. When I was, you know, when I interview people about Jim, and I always I would always ask everybody, how tall was Jim? And people would be like, I think he was probably six six. And you know, Oz is like, well, I'm six two, and he was taller than me, so probably six one. Jim on his passport every time self-reported as six one. Really? That's it. Yep. So then Fr- Frank's probably lying about his height then, because 
he can't be. Well, I, I don't yeah. think so. Frank's a big Frank's a big guy. I mean, Frank's I, I would say Frank's at least six two. Oh wow! Um, but he he you know he was like he was like well Jim was w- definitely taller than me. And I what I love about that is I think it goes to speak. I think it speaks to presence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and Jim, Jim, of course, was taller than everybody. He you was know. larger than life. <laughs> he was larger than life. But, you know, I've got copies of his driver's license, his passport, that he's reporting yeah. the info on it. And he reported as 6'1 every wow. time. Wow. You heard it here, folks. Exclusive news. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's, I can't even believe that. I'm, like, sitting here. I literally, like, my jaw dropped when you said that. Yeah, th- that was one of those fun questions I asked everybody. I would ask everybody, how tall was he? Um, I would always uh, ask people to tell me what he ordered when they went out to eat, mm-hmm. um, because that was when you get all the great stories about how everyone always says the same thing. I don't remember, but I'm sure we ordered dessert. Yeah, that was one of my favorite stories reading about was just how it was Jim loved dessert. Yep. And he would yeah, he, he would ask for the dessert tray every time so he could look at it and he would point to everything and ask what everything was. It's been a absolute delight talking with you, Brian. And well, as we were saying earlier, Josh, you and I have known each other in quotes for a long time through social media and so on. But we, this is the first time we've actually ever spoken. Josh, oh, yeah. Josh and I, have, Josh and I have texted each other at, you know, two o'clock in the morning on something that's come up and things like that. But this is the first time we've actually ever spoken. And it's just it, it <laughs> continues to be surreal to me because I, I, I said it earlier, but the Jim Henson biography, I treat as like a Bible like, like whenever I'm writing a script for something or writing even just a tweet and I'm like, okay, do I have all the right information? What does Brian's book say? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if you had a bunch of little like tabs in there. Oh, I don't. I just, <laughs> honestly, I ended up buying it off of, I, I guess it's the Apple bookstore, just so I mm-hmm. could search words oh, yeah. by, by word. <laughs> You know, I actually, I actually have, uh, I bought my own books off on Kindle so I can do the exact same thing where I'm like, oh, I remember that, but uh, let me just search for the word. I remember, yeah, I have, I have it electronically for that very reason. Yeah, same here. And if you have never read it, it is. It's like top tier. It is, it it is the biopic that they're trying to make. It is the, (laughs) like, really Jim Henson's life would only work as a mini series at this point, Mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah. Ooh, that's a great idea. Um. So if you've never read it or listened to it, please do yourself a favor and bring some tissues along the way because you're going to need them because the story that Brian weaves through these chapters are just, is just one that will stick with you forever. It might change the way you view Jim Henson and it may make you appreciate him all the more. Plus you get to hear Frank Goss swearing up a storm and that's always a delight. And it's beautifully... (laughs) And not a surprise in the slightest. And it's beautifully written too. Like I mean, I've, I'm I'm a very big biopic person, and or not, oh, not biopic. I well, biography. I I prefer to read those more than anything else. But it's, and I'm not just saying this because it's Jim, but it's definitely, and not just saying this because you know you're here, but definitely probably the best I've ever read, and I've ever, uh, yeah. So oh, not okay. trying to flatter you, but well, you try to. You, you try to rise to the occasion. I, I used to, every morning I would get up to write this and I would look in the mirror and I'd, I'd just say, do not mess this up. <laughs> well, you definitely didn't. So <laughs> it's just, it's no, oh, you, you. you perfected it. Now, uh, Brian, where can people find you on uh, the interwebs, social media and such? So you can always find me running my mouth on Twitter at Brian J. Jones, spell out my middle name, J A Y. Brian J. Jones, my website is also brianjjones.com, uh, where I'm running my mouth there as well. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm not there as often. As, Twitter's the place to find me. So find me mostly on Twitter at Brian J. Jones. You'll see me jabbering at Josh every once in a while as well. Oops. All right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You it was so, so much. nice kind of meeting you. <laughs> yeah. No, I look forward to it. We'll do it again. Don't worry. Awesome. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye. Once again, we'd like to give a special thanks to Brian J. Jones for being our guest on this episode. Definitely check out Jim Henson, the biography, and he's done a lot. George Lucas was another one. If you would like to follow me, I am halfhearted underscore JG. Or, of course, you can follow me as History Muppet on Twitter, Muppet History everywhere else. And Madison, where can they find you? On Twitter, uh, you can find me at at Steely Dam with two and no, sorry, three ends at the end, and then a Hall and Oats meal on Instagram. 
if you so choose. Alrighty, so I think that about does it for this episode of the Muppet History Podcast. We'd like to say sorry to Dave Goals. We didn't have enough time for you this week. But we'll all see you next time on the Muppet History Podcast. Bye!